Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity to open your word. And Lord, we rely 100% on your Holy Spirit to discern your word. You tell us that your word is not carnal, it's spiritual. And without spiritual eyes, we cannot understand. Without paying attention to the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, we cannot understand, nor can we apply. So we count on you today, Lord, to open our eyes to something wonderful in your Word. Lord, to lighten our steps, to guide our path, Lord, to show us what you have for us on this very day. So we anxiously await seeing what your Spirit will tell us through your Word today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, most of you are familiar with uh, weekly, mostly weekly, sometimes I follow that on a job. We have our Esther moments, and now we're starting Galatians moments, which is just kind of a quick recording of what we're going to be doing the following week. This morning, I want to have something a little different. I'm going to call it an Israel Minute. So I've asked Beulah Mary to come to and speak to us a little bit about her experience and her time in the land of Israel. Come on up. And as you know, uh, we're very, very staunch supporters of Israel because God is a very staunch supporter of Israel. We support Israel because God supports them. We, it's clear in his word. So, yes. All right. I'm done. You're up. Thank you, Donna. Um, I need to get a little bit personal because something really, really special happened today during the music. It was like every word that my life so filled with joy. And and I thought back, I thought back to my, I go back to my childhood. I, re, I remember standing out in the yard, Minnesota, northern Minnesota, looking up at heaven and just crying to God. I wanted to know him. I wanted to know him so badly. And, and when I got a little bit older, I got brave enough to go to the empty church I was raised Catholic and go up to the pulpit like this. And I preached to the empty church. And I had a lot of experiences all over the world teaching and talking and even a little television a couple of times. But today, I felt like that dream came true. It came true for me. I was that teenager, 13, 14, up there talking to the empty church. And someday I knew that God would, would put me to help people get to know him better, put me in places like this. And um, I'm just really grateful to share that moment with you. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about my born again experience. Um, I first was born again. They call it born again, but really for me it was kind of like the very, very beginning where God poured his spirit out and I just felt it come over me. And I felt this huge sense of responsibility and I realized that got to make some serious changes. And now I had a friend who was going to be with me every moment of every day, right there, counseling me, guiding me. Showing, my, showing me what to do and what to say. And so I'm very grateful for that. That was 1971, so it's been, you know, a couple months ago. <laughs> Oops, sorry. So anyway, I, I was born again, uh, as a born again Christian, I was baptized in 1981. And it's been a, it's been a joy. Um, uh, don't, don't know exactly how much you know about my Jewish history, but a couple years later when I married my Jewish husband from Israel, I converted to Judaism, and they warned me. They said, you might get up, they call it a bima, and they may ask you to renounce Christ and your Christianity. And I came right out and I said, if they say that, I'm walking down. I don't care who's watching, you know what I mean? I won't, I won't do that. They didn't. They didn't ask me to, so I was blessed. And now I understand, and I got that realization again standing there singing that that's why God wanted me to be a Jewess, to feel what they feel. And, and to have the access now to Israel that I could go there any time I want because my son lives there. And had I not had those experiences, that wouldn't have happened. And so it's been, it's been a really great blessing for me. One more thing. Two years ago, the Lord said to me, he said, because I had kind of thought, well, there's the father and the son. And I couldn't understand quite why they weren't trying to get to know the father better. Because really, the, when I received the anointing, it was in my mind that he worked first. Because this was the whole decade of the 70s. I, I didn't actually, wasn't actually born again until the end of the 70s. It took a lot of spiritual training and, and work with, with the spirit to have that experience. But um, what was that last thing I wanted to say? Oh, yeah. Two years ago, 
Father said to me, he said, I was Jesus. <gasps> what are you talking about? I was Jesus, unreservedly. And then I remembered later on that I had an experience um, way back then, 79, where um, the Lord gave me an experience that is beyond our minds to really explain. But he showed me what, what Christ went through. And I saw his face, and I saw the blood, and um, he was in a cave like this. And I thought, what the heck? I never never heard of that. I'd studied a lot, but I'd never heard that he was kept in a cave-like place. But that was what I saw. About 20 years later, uh, somebody was doing a, a, what do you call those television things, took a camera in there, and he said, this is where they held Christ at the, in the caves underneath the Caiaphas's temple, or not temple, uh, palace, thank you, thank you. And, uh, and, I, and I just went, wow, I said, I, I saw that, I was there, I saw that. And I finally knew it was a real experience, but I never knew how to get, get there, you know? So I did a little bit of research, and I've been there twice since then, I was there just a few months ago. And both times the Lord just emptied it out, and I was there by myself crying and experiencing when God is with you, he's just with you. He does incredible miracles. And I know that the experience that he gave me was real. There's no way I could have made it up. So when he said, I was Jesus, I remember that moment where in, in the cave, I felt God's spirit is the father, leave the son. And shortly after that, he went to the cross and died. And before he died, he said, so if I can get it right, Eli, Eli, Lama, well, why, why, Lord, have you forsaken me? And that was how it happened. I always wondered, when did he forsake me? How did that happen? At least this was my experience. And I'm sticking to it. And I know that God is good. And I'm so glad that I got to share my graduation or coming out day with you folks. Because it was a really special experience. And I'm very grateful. for that. That was beautiful. So this morning, the book of Galatians. This is going to be fun, folks. The book of Galatians is an extremely hard-hitting and impactful book. So much so, and I'll be bold here, that a careful study of this book, if it were done in every church, across America, could very well shake up much of everything that is taught and preached today. Again, I'll be bold. A great awakening, a spiritual revival, which would tear this nation up, could very well be just a Galatians proclamation away. That's how impactful this book can be. Before we dive into the book, there is a lot of background details and a lot of research that we need to do to lay the foundation so we can get a full view of what the situations were that caused Paul the need to write this to the Galatian churches. Now, first of all, just as a, you know, not a reality, but a situation here, there was no one Galatian churches. There were multiple Galatian churches. It was a region known as Galatia. There was a north and a south. We'll get into all that next week. But this was written to the churches in the region of Galatia, to the churches of the Galatians. First of all, the first thing we want to determine is what was the need for Paul to write this letter to the Galatian churches? As we've said so many times before, I don't know how many weeks go by when I don't mention it, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 1.9, that which has been will be, that which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. There really is nothing new under the sun. Quite often we come upon new things in Scripture and we think, oh, this is new. But the more you research, no, it's not new. It just might be the first time we saw it, but it's not the first time it was there. Paul is going to be addressing philosophical attitudes 
that faced the early church, particularly those in the area of Galatia, which are issues that we still face today. This is one of the most important epistles there is for us today, right now. Incredibly important. These are not new issues that Paul's going to be addressing. All throughout history, man has a tendency to gravitate towards legalism and religion, which is earning God's favor by our own efforts. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 4, please. I'm going to see something here a little bit unusual. Genesis chapter 4. We'll pick up, we'll just pick up in verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So let's get a little feel for what's going on here. In Hebrews 11, 1 through 4, which we'll, we'll go back and look in, in a few minutes, it says, By faith, Abel offered his offering. God received it. God respected it. So then conversely... Cain's offering was rejected because it wasn't of faith, right? Many will teach that the problem was Abel offered the very best while Cain just offered some fruit. The Bible doesn't tell us that. What it tells us by implication in Hebrews, let's just read that. Turn, turn to a Hebrews 11. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 4. Sorry, this is noisy. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. We've said it before, faith is not doing what we feel is right. The Bible says there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Faith is not doing something that we want to do and hoping that God approves of it. Faith is operating off of what God has told us to do. That's faith. We have an entire Bible here, Genesis to Revelation, to stand on, to walk in, to base our lives on, to have faith in. If Abel offered a sacrifice strictly because that was what he wanted to do of the sheep, then the Bible would have said, and Abel did a good thing. didn't say he would have done it by faith. So by implication, I'm saying God had already told them what he wanted in the way of sacrifice. Prior to the Levitical laws, which were written and given to the Israelites, they already knew. Classic example, when God told Noah, he was going to bring seven of the clean and two of the unclean of all these different animals. How did Noah know what was clean and what was unclean? That wasn't written for another 1,500 years. It was written then, but they already knew it. God had already told them. Abel offered his sacrifice of the sheep and the fat thereof, which incidentally is exactly the language used in Leviticus, 
Abel offered his sacrifice because this is what God had told him he wanted, and he did it in faith. Cain, however, came up with a better plan. Now, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth and thoughts in his heart, but, you know, he might have thought, you know, that whole sheep thing? That's kind of a bust, you know, because I don't have any of them. I don't have sheep. So if I'm going to get a sheep, I've got to go to my brother, kind of grovel and maybe trade. or I don't want to do that. I've got a better way. So I'm going to bring God some fruit. The problem with that is the ground is cursed. The act of his mother and father in the garden cursed the earth. We do not offer to God that which is cursed. We kill that which is cursed. When we give ourselves, make our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, we're not doing him a great favor by giving something that's awesome. We are sacrificing that which needs to be killed. The old man does not need to be applauded. He needs to be crucified. I am crucified with Christ and risen with him. So, the point with all this in Genesis is that what Paul is addressing to the Galatians is not a new thing. It started a long time ago. Religion and man's efforts to gain God's approval by his own works has been going on a long time. There is nothing new under the sun, and it's still going on today. The age-old idea of pleasing God by works is what Paul is going to be dealing with in Galatians. Specifically, Paul is dealing with what were known as Judaizers. They were religious zealots who militantly insisted that Gentiles who were, came to Christ had to be circumcised and put themselves under the Mosaic law for that salvation to be effective. What's interesting is that these Judaizers, by implication, weren't Israel unbelievers. They were Jewish Christians. They were in folly, they were in error, and they were misled and attempting with all of their heart to drag everyone with them into their folly. This falsehood wreaked more havoc in the church than all the persecutions and murders. And here's why. Persecution, even under death, with the intent to force a believer to deny Jesus Christ, as we mentioned, always ends up strengthening the church. Always. Even under Emperor Nero, who would coat believers in tar, stick them on a pole, put them in his garden, and light them on fire alive, to light up his garden parties. Even that didn't crush the church. Those who committed their lives and by implication their very death to Jesus Christ stood strong and stood firm. However, falsehoods, false teaching, deviations from scripture, either intentional or unintentional, trusting in religion rather than trusting in God, always weakens the church always some examples turn with me to the other end of the book revelation chapter 2 as we go through galatians we're going to go left to right right to left front to back spend some time in the middle yes ma'am revelation chapter 2 beginning in verse 1 To the angel of the church, oh, by the way, background, if you don't know, this is Jesus Christ giving messages to seven actual churches in this region, which has implication in church age, church history, individual fellowships, and our own lives. Broad, broad application here. Okay, so to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly 
and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The most important part of that is remember your first love, repent, and do the first works. But in the midst of that letter, he commends them because you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of question on what exactly were the deeds, was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The most reasonable interpretation is that in the early church, they develop a system where the professional religionist, if you would, the pastor, the whatever they call them, the professional would know and understand the word of God and would give that to everyone else. And he was responsible to do the God stuff. They were responsible to listen to him. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? That system is still run rampant throughout the world. There are many people who stand in the pulpit and tell you, this is what God says. Now close your Bible and listen to me. Even Paul said those in Thessalonica were more noble. Or the Bereans, no, it wasn't Paul. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the truth willingly, but searched the scriptures daily to see which things be so. Anyone who speaks to you of things of God better do it with their Bible, and you better check it out. Because it is the Bible, it is the scriptures which tell us which things be so. So the Nicolaitans set up a laity, if you will, where they were authoritative and everyone was under them. And I, as I said, there's nothing new under the sun because um, I heard a story a while back of a particular couple who were going to buy a car. And in the midst of this discussion, the husband's talking back and forth with the salesman. Any of you who have ever bought a car know how painful this is. But in the midst of this, the, the wife spoke up and said something to which the husband immediately turned to her and said, you know where you stand. And so she immediately shut up and didn't say another word. Point being, their church, their doctrine, their pastor, their system has taught them that the man is the head of his household, as Scripture says, but that the woman is totally subservient to him and is to be domineered and watched over and kept under the man's thumb. The man is under the church leadership. If you're going to buy a house, you have to go to church leadership. See if they approve. They're going to look at your finances, check over your money, look at the neighborhood. Is it good? Is it not good? Folks, that is not in your Bible. Certainly not in mine. And how ridiculous is that? Would anybody on this planet, and my family would verify this, begin to say I have the capacity to manage any of your affairs? I struggle keeping track of my own stuff. You're supposed to come to me with your... No, no, that is not godly. That is not godly. That's the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They set up a church hierarchy, and everyone was subservient to them, not to Christ. Incidentally, that's one of the reasons that we had the Dark Ages, because the church set itself up as God's authority and made it illegal to read God's word to check them out. You could be burned for having a copy of the scriptures. It was not your job to search the scriptures to see which things be so. It was your job to listen to them and be obedient to them. Jesus Christ hates that. Amen. Jesus is the head of his church. Jesus gives us direction. Jesus commands us. Jesus is our king. He's our Lord. He gives us marching orders, no one else. Jump down to verse 9 in Revelation, chapter 2. Eh, we should start at 8. To, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and come to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. 
I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. But you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Notice that they were being persecuted, and they were afraid of those who said they are Jews but are not. Their synagogue of Satan. The Judaizers infiltrated the church to the point where it became very, very damaging, incredibly damaging. And it's still damaging today. There are multiple forms of Judaizers. There's multiple forms of legalism. There are multiple things that are wreaking havoc among the church today as bad as it ever has, if not worse. You need to be on guard for that. Revelation 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days when Antipas, Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This particular church was accepting not only of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but also the doctrine of Balaam, sexual immorality, religious impurity. They were accepting of all kinds of things. And Jesus said, I hate this. Therefore, repent. One last one in Revelation. No, I lied. I turn to Revelation 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you've kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. And we'll stop there. Now no, notice he calls these of the synagogue of Satan to come and worship before them, not worship them, worship him in their presence. You need to be clear on that. Those people will worship Jesus Christ in the presence of the true believer. If those Judaizers were saved and were misled and were causing a problem and the Lord restores them, praise God, then they will be worshiping Christ unto salvation in the presence of those who weren't misled. But it's Christ they'll be worshiping. And he was commending them, not those, but the synagogue of Satan. Now it's one last one in Revelation. Pick up in verse 14, please. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish that you were hot or cold, so then because you are lukewarm and neither hot, no, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich, become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is the end of a progressive situation in the church at the time, in history, if you will, in congregations and even in our lives. When we accept falsehoods, when we accept false doctrines, when we accept sin, when we accept and excuse our own behaviors, when religion becomes our God, Jesus is forced outside. There's no room for him in the church if he's not in the center. Jesus will not stand around the periphery. Jesus will not scoot down that wall between the wall and the rows of chairs to not get in your way. Jesus will not tiptoe and dance on eggshells in his own house. He is either king of his house or he'll go outside and wait till he's king of his house. Interestingly enough, he's also earnestly desiring to come in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He might have been pushed out, but he earnestly desires to come back in. God is not willing that any should perish. He wants repentance. He wants us to turn to him. If we've gotten caught up in these things, he wants us to return to him. He's going to show what sin we have in our life, and he wants us to repent. He doesn't want to crush us for that. He doesn't want to condemn us. He wants to bring our sin to our eyes so that we can repent and return to him. Because in our heart of hearts, we don't want Jesus standing outside knocking. Little pig, little pig, let me in. We don't want that. We want him in our hearts. We want him comfortable in his own house. We've given him our lives. We've given him our hearts. Lord, make with us what you will. That is the point of being conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Take all that I am and make it what you want. Open the closets, open the doors, shine the light on the secret places, and that is painful, folks. We got a lot of junk hiding in the shadows, amen? And if you tell me you don't, then your name is Jesus and you need to take the pulpit. But, but otherwise... We've all got junk hiding in the corner in the shadows. We couldn't take it. We couldn't bear it if he showed it all at once. Along our journey, along our process of being conformed into the image and likeness of Christ, step by step, corner by corner, he shines the light. We need to take care of that now. And he's not going to take care of the next corner until you let him take care of this one. You've got to deal with this closet. You know what's in there. And when you're done with that, we'll move on to the next one. Well, Lord, can't we just skip over this and, you know, let's go to the kitchen. I got a lot of lights in there. There's nothing. Nope. Got to fix this closet. But I want to go over here. You can go over there, but we got to fix this closet. Amen. If Jesus didn't want to come in, he wouldn't knock on the door. Think about that. As humans... Sometimes we can um, live out the phrase, I'm done with this. I'm done with that. I'm done with you. I've had enough. But yeah, we're done here. Jesus isn't that way. God is not that way. God is very patient. God is very loving. Christ didn't die on the cross so that he could wait for us to make one mistake and say, I'm done with you. Even when we make lots of mistakes, even if we get to the point we've shoved him so far out that he has to stand at the door and knock, he will stand at the door and knock because he loves you. Hmm. This is why the book of Galatians is so important for us today. We don't want Jesus to be outside looking in. We want him to be front and center, preeminent, the king among his people. Jesus Christ is our king. He is the king. Even of those who reject him, they will bow their knee to him and proclaim that he is king. 
Jesus is our king. He is the king. He needs to be front and center preeminent. Galatians is a very hard-hitting, forceful letter. There's no commendations. There's no accolades. There's no personal addresses by name to any of the congregants. So it's a, a bit unusual for Paul's letters. In this letter, Paul doesn't request for them to pray for him. Also unusual. There's no friendly communications, just direct confrontations. Paul is so stern in this letter because the churches in Galatia were at risk. Their very foundations were under attack. Who they were in Christ, that foundation that Jesus' cross bought for them, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, if he had not been crucified and raised from the dead, if it weren't for the cross, Christ would not be the cornerstone. Their very foundation, who they are in Jesus Christ, was under attack, was being perverted, and they were accepting it. That's where the Galatians were. They were buying into the falsehood. They were being deceived. They were accepting it. Make no mistake, the epistle to the Galatians, epistle to the Galatians, is spiritual warfare. Plain and simple. The Holy Spirit, by divine inspiration through Apostle Paul, was warring against the forces of darkness that were attacking his church. This letter, this epistle, is a war rally. Now, I've heard it said that the book of Romans, also written by Paul, was from Paul's head, while Galatians was written from his heart. The book of Romans, absolutely fantastic. It's a doctrinal thesis. It is basically Paul's gospel of everything. In it, we're instructed on what Christianity is, on how we live. It is a full collegiate level course, if you will, on Christianity in preparation for living as a Christian. Full doctrinal dissertation. Galatians is like a mini Romans, but it's hard, fast, and firm. The book of Romans is like a complete training program. The book of Galatians is like a visit to the troops in the trenches in the midst of a great battle. In this battle, the enemy is attacking with full force, and the troops needed a reminder of the things they already knew. Now remember, the churches in Galatia, well, I shouldn't say remember. We'll talk some more about this next week. The churches in Galatia were established by Paul on his first missionary journey. These were his children. These were the people that he brought to Christ and established. And he's reaching them in the trenches, in the midst of a battle. The enemy is attacking full force, and they don't even know it. So this letter to them is like the great wake-up call. You know, sometimes along this life, we need to be, um, I was going to say I need to be careful with my language, but when do I do that? Sometimes we need to be coddled. We need to be pet. You know, my, my granddaughter, my wife keeps our granddaughter quite a bit. And there's times when she needs to be held. And she needs to be cuddled. And she needs to cry because she needs to cry. And you need to, shh, it's okay, it's okay. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need, and, and the Lord talks to me in a stern way because that's what I hear. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes in my head the Lord needs to tell me, wake up, boy. Knock it off. What are you doing? You know better. Sometimes I need a word of encouragement. Sometimes I need a boot in the shorts. Tell me I'm not the only one here in the house. <laughs> Amen, brother. Sometimes we need that boot. The book of Galatians is that boot. That's the boot. Yes. They needed a reminder. They needed a war rally. They needed something to gather themselves together in the midst of this battle so that they weren't destroyed. The Holy Spirit sent that reminder through Paul in a very quick, stern fashion because there's no time for playing around when you're on the battleground. 
when you're in the training corps, when you're in preparing for your military campaign, if you will, there might be a little time for horseplay. You know, you got you got 18 months to train. Okay, you know, there might be some relaxation. When you're on the battlefield in the trenches, there is no time for playing around. The Holy Spirit showed up through this letter to the Galatians, and I'm paraphrasing here, saying, wake up, there's no time. You're in danger. You're in danger. You know, if you take a frog and you want to boil this frog so you can have some nice frog legs, you don't boil the pot of water and throw the frog in because he's going to jump out. Hot. Nobody wants to be in the boiling pot of water, right? So what you do is you put the frog in the water, room temperature, they're nice and comfy. You put the pot on the stove and you turn the fire up just a little bit. And so that frog sits there in that water. Oh, this is cozy. It's comfy. This is what he likes. And you just slowly, slowly turn up that water. Turn it up, and he never realizes he's boiling. Never realizes he's in danger. Of course, too late. It's over. The church has been in a pot of water. And the enemy has slowly been turning up the heat. Slowly turning up that heat. Let's introduce a little leaven over here. A little sin over here. A little compromise over here. A little deviation from Scripture here. And the church has slowly, slowly allowed the heat to come up. This book of Galatians should be a warning if we're in that position as individuals, as a congregation, denomination, anywhere we are in Christ. That if we find ourselves in the water that's just a little too hot, it's time to get out. We've talked many times over the last few months of different things that we've seen among uh, what North America calls the church. We talked about a church in Canada who has a, an atheist pastor, doesn't believe in God, but that doesn't mean you can't be a good pastor. Really? How's that work? What, where does she take you? If you guys come to us with a problem, we're going to Jesus. I, I, I got nothing for you. But we're, but we're going to Jesus, and we're going to find him here in this book. If you don't believe in God, you don't believe in Jesus, what do you do? Where do you take people? You just shoulder all their burdens. So that's ridiculous. There's another outfit we've talked about recently where the pastor of a very large megachurch told his congregation that it's time to unhook ourselves from the Old Testament to release ourselves from the bondage of the Ten Commandments. And even large sections of the New Testament, if they're not red letters, we don't need to be bound to. We, we need to be showing the love of Christ. We need to be doing godly things. But we, we need to disconnect ourselves from all this stuff. There's another church recently who decided to step up and sponsor a drag queen who has a weekly reading to children lost their funding was going to lose their rental or whatever so a local congregation to show the heart of Christ said that they would fund this as the drag queen read stories to children and in some cases danced in very provocative manners with very little clothes on any one of these statements, any one of these situations, as we, we talk here, we're shocked at. But I can tell you this, the people in their congregations have been slowly boiled to the point where they're not shocked. Let that sink in. We're shocked by it because we haven't been boiled in their pot. We need to pray for them. We need to go to battle for them on our knees. They need a Galatians moment. They do. They need the Holy Spirit to show up in their fellowship the way Paul showed up here in Galatia. Who has bewitched you? That's how he's going to open that. It's very stern, very stern. 
We don't want to be the frog in the boiling water. And God is faithful enough, if we have attitudes, if we have things that we've condoned or accepted, allowed to root in our life, he'll show that to us if we just ask. We have a theme verse for our study through the book of Galatians, which will appear on our website in different places. And that's Galatians 6.14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. If you're going to brag about something, brag about the cross. Which reminds me of another comment that I heard a few years ago, another mega pastor, who said the teaching and preaching of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ on a cross was nothing less than false advertisement for a bloody, vengeful God. And so they wouldn't teach the cross. They wouldn't teach the crucifixion. They wouldn't teach the resurrection. They wouldn't teach sin. They wouldn't teach that Christ bled and suffered for our sins because they said it was false advertisement. Again, we on this side are shocked at that. Those congregations in that part of pot of water weren't quite so shocked because they've been boiling a long time. We don't want to be there. We want to boast in the cross of Christ. We want to let our king be our king. Before he was our king, he was our savior. Before he was crowned king of kings and lord of lords, he died on a cross and he gave it all. Every bit of blood, everything he had, paid for our sins. So this book is going to be at times very heavy, very forceful, uh, the kick in the shorts, the hammer between the eyes, because there was no time for playing around. And sometimes in our lives, there's no time for playing around either. There's times the Lord has to come to me fast and hard because I don't have time to gather up the mess I put myself in. He's just got to come and fix it now, handle it. So praise God for that. Next week, we're going to get into some of the history of the Galatians, how they were established, how they came to be, Paul's conversion, missionary journeys, etc. So in preparation, um, read and get familiar with Acts chapter 9, Paul's conversion, and Acts chapter 15. Both of those will play a very key part in what we do from here forward. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we do so often for your word. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you will speak sternly when you need to speak sternly. And you will speak gently when you need to speak gently. And we thank you that this book of Galatians is an example of how much you love your own, that you will not allow us or them to stay in error without very, very stern warnings. We ask you, Lord, to open our eyes to your word throughout the coming week. We ask you, Lord, to open our eyes to those in danger, including ourselves, that we need to pray for. Lord, there's many times we see things, oh, how could they do that? How could they say that? We need to look at that and go, that's a call to prayer. We need to pray for them. Even if we don't know them, Lord, I, I need to lift them up that you can restore such a one. So, Lord, in the midst of this hard-hitting epistle, we pray that your grace and your mercy and your love would show up on every page, every verse, every time we open this word. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.